welcome to another episode of Arbitration Life. I am Janet Brin. And I'm Hannah Jamal. As in any type of hearing, a court reporter can prove to be a rather critical resource to an arbitration hearing. A certified transcriptionist will record the entire arbitration verbatim in order to provide parties the opportunity to review exactly what was said. Absolutely, and today hearings often go for top-notch real-time transcription, both on-site and off-site for remote hearings. And to be a good reporter, especially one capable of managing high-profile arbitration cases, takes a very special skill set. And while we have today a very special guest uh, who will tell us about what it takes to be a lead court reporter, I had to chance to meet him for my first uh, investor state arbitration hearing, and I remember it was in London. And later on, I saw him for different uh, hearings, mostly in Washington, D.C. Uh, Janet, I know you know him as well. He is absolutely a very cool guy, an absolute pleasure to work with, no stranger to the BBI International Arbitration Center, having worked on cases here, also participated in our arbitration conference and mock hearing. Prior to becoming a co-founder of Worldwide Reporting LLP in 2006, he worked for several years at Miller Reporting Company on Capitol Hill. 33 plus years in court reporting, he has worked on several high profile cases from the William Kennedy Smith 1990 rape trial, audio transcriptions, depositions, and US District Court hearings for the Nixon tape to several international arbitration cases. Please welcome senior partner and lead court reporter at Worldwide Reporting, David Castan. Hi, David. Hi, Hola. David. How, How are you? you? Nice yeah, to see you. Good to see you. Nice to see you too. Wow. No, this no. is exciting. Very. Yes. Now, David, in your line of work, does, it does require a rather unique set of skills. This is why we're so excited to talk to you. Yes. So I have to kick things off by asking you, what do you you think makes a good court reporter? There are several and, things. And, and, wait, and how do you do it? Yeah. How do you do it? Uh, it? You have to have, I always recommend people who have had backgrounds in piano playing that they go into court reporting because you use the same mechanisms of the brain and ear, eye, and hand contact in the sense that where you are playing on a piano scales and chords and beautiful songs and everything, uh, you're doing the same thing with the steno machine, which I actually have here. So here you got yeah. just a small set of keys and you have to learn how to manipulate these keys like you would on a piano, but you're more constricted in space. Right. And so part of the training uh, is when you go through and learn how to um, work a machine like this because we're not intuitively um, inclined to um, learn how these devices work until you get through training. But I can tell you that if you do have a background in piano playing, it'll be a natural for you to learn stenotype on the machine itself. Um, I think that is my first, you know, recommendation, but I think the most important thing is to love language. You have to have a love of language, grammar, punctuation, and the will and the strong desire to learn new things about your own language. And then also to delve into the language of law itself, whether it's domestic or international. Um, when you go through training program where they might have a university setting for you, uh, if you spend 10 to 11 hours a day practicing uh, for a very extended period of time, perhaps upwards of two years, that is similar to Karate Kid when he teaches that uh, the Karate Kid to, he, he tells them go paint the fence, but do it in a certain way. You know, and do the whole fence. 
And the same with waxing a car, you know, wax on and wax off. And the tediousness of practicing 10, 10 to 11 hours a day pays off because you develop these instincts um, in your head that you can actually develop quick response time, which is what you need when you're listening to people speak. So I think the practicing uh, does help you push up the speed ladder in order to get you know, to a graduation point that you can actually start working. But also there's professional development that it doesn't end with school. It ends with learning about uh, courtroom procedures, how things are done in our business, and to also maintain your skill levels to the point where you get credentials uh, provided by the National Court Reporters Association. So I think a combination of mentorship and also self-drive uh, will make a good court reporter. But you have to have an open mind to learn new things, to learn new language. Uh, well, not necessarily a full language, but uh, French terms, Latin terms, Spanish terms, uh, things that come up in our you know, job every day. So I was lucky to have been mentored by a couple of World War II court reporters, one who worked in the Nuremberg trials, another, another one who worked for George Stilwell in China while the civil war in China was going on until it ended in 1947. And they taught me exactly how to do my job in a very, very professional and fun manner. And so I think that once you have someone who can, you know, guide you and push you in certain directions uh, from experience, that you start to feel good about it. So you can take your love of language and, and the prior items I had mentioned and integrate everything and then grow as a professional court reporter. Wow, that's great. But yes. You were mentioning self-drive. So talking about self-drive, you and your business partner, Randy Zalman, founded yes. Worldwide Reporting at LP in March 2006. Correct. Uh, could you please let us know uh, what initially led to the creation of this company? Yes. The unfortunate thing started with the death of the owner of the company. And that was in 2004. And then with new ownership that took over, uh, basically drove that company into the ground. And at that point, I realized that, you know what, we have all this work that's just going to just go to waste if we don't incorporate ourselves. And so we created worldwide reporting in 2006 in order to bring the international work that I had developed solely at Miller reporting into uh, worldwide. Okay. So it was, uh, it was, it started with an unfortunate situation because uh, I had been with Miller since 1988 and uh, he engendered a lot of uh, good things in me uh, as a court reporter. One of them being loyalty to the company that I worked for because for one, he paid us on time, never a paycheck bounced. Um, it was a good environment to work in. And plus we were at the center of the universe Washington, D.C., he was on Capitol Hill, and we had done work in the U.S. Congress, IMF and World Bank, and you just go down the whole list. And so that gave me an opportunity to see what potential work I could do. And since I had an interest in international affairs anyway, uh, especially geopolitical relationships, that uh, I thought, what a natural thing to, a uh, natural place to uh tie myself. Yeah. So that was a, a really good, good thing. So you seem to have had an interest in this for a very long time, because I, I read that before you started working at Miller Reporting Company on Capitol Hill, you had started court reporting school yes. right after college, it sounded like. Yes. So like, what really propelled you to like, this is what I want to do. This is the career path. Uh, the first thing is I was not inclined to go to law school. 
Um, I took con law 101 back in uh, college and I dropped it in the first week because I realized that certain part of my brain did not, you know, tolerate learning case studies, uh, case law from the bottom up, but I could appreciate everything from the top down. So in that sense, I realized that law school is not cut out for me, but I had been walking around in the fine arts building at the university where I was going and and I saw, uh, I, at the time I was an English major uh, before I added history and political science as two full majors as well. A notice on the bulletin board that said, what can English majors do for careers? And the first one at the top was court reporting. And I thought that sounds intriguing. And so I just kind of squared it away in the back of my mind and I you know, pursued the goal of going to graduate school. Well, as soon as that didn't pan out very well, um, I had met Randy at that point and his sisters were both court reporters in New York City. And they said, this is a great job. You'll always have a job wherever you go. You'll enjoy what you're gonna hear. And, uh, and it's a good way to put all your uh, knowledge of what you learned in life and also in school you know, to work. And so that's exactly what I did. Uh, when I moved to Washington in 1986, I went to three different court reporting schools, but they all failed. But I managed to use my self-drive to teach myself after a certain beginning phase of my training to continue building my speed to improve on my skill itself. And then I got a job at Miller in 1988. That's great. Uh, and uh, what led to the transition of international arbitration work then? The desire to get out of uh, the federal court work, because there was so much, there were so many uh, problems with doing endless gang trials, murder trials, drug trials. And I I had always had an interest in, like I said, international affairs. And I thought, you know, now's the time to really think about how am I going to pull this off? And at the time in 1993, uh, Miller had gotten a request for a reporter to cover um, a claim filed against the US State Department over a gold mine that was destroyed in uh, war-torn Yugoslavia. And they said, we have a hearing that's going to go for a week and a half. Would you be interested in doing it? And I said, yes, I would. And that was the beginning. Uh, so that was around 1993. And, and I thought, you know, this is exactly where I want to go. And I did not have any more <clears throat> international arbitrations until about 1997. Okay. And they dealt with uh, <clears throat> failed rocket launches and you know, really good scientific stuff that I like uh, as well. And, but in between, I also had other cases that buttressed my knowledge of the legal profession that helped to go into international when I got a call from Mixit in 1998 asking, what is this real time all about? And at that point, I was in the US versus Microsoft trial and I talked to them and they said, would you come down and give a demonstration for us? And I said, absolutely. So Randy and I went down there with a bunch of computers and, and uh, all the counsel in the office at the time came in and I sat it down. Randy read a couple of paragraphs and some Q's and A's. And I was, I was stenoing away and they're watching. And within two minutes, the secretary general of ICSA said, that's exactly what we're looking for. We have a hearing coming up in four weeks. Can you do it? And I said, yeah, this is the last week that I have coming up for the Microsoft trial. So yes, I will. And it turned out to be the biggest kahuna of all, the Vendi One, which is the standard case that everybody talks about and refers to in uh, uh, opening and closings and so forth. So. Wow, it's funny because my next question was gonna ask, what was your most intense case you had ever worked on? <laughs> in 1993, 
I worked for the Teamsters Union here in Washington, D.C. And they had what they, they fired the president of the Teamsters Union. And so they asked me to cover the board meetings uh, leading to the decision. And so that was oh, lasted for about two weeks. But then about three weeks later, they had the conference revocation hearings where they were getting rid of the mid-level mid -level management within the union itself. And so in Washington over Memorial Day weekend in 1993, we got, we started the hearings where the management showed up to confront the board. And the board consisted of 12 members for each side, the president and the vice president and a secretary of the union itself. And the reason I mention this is because this was the most outrageous thing I'd ever seen. They had police outside the door. And I thought, why do you need to have police in a union board meeting? Well, it turned out to be they were getting into fist fights. They were throwing chairs across the room. And, right. and one member carried a cane that had a lead pipe inside. And he was running around chasing some of the other members of the board before the police came in to, you know, wheel them out of the room to uh, cool down. Well, we went until midnight that first night. And there were three times when I had to get up, take my steno machine and get out of the way because then the chair started flying and you wouldn't believe the chaos. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. That yes, took baby. intense to a different oh, level. It was That's intense, right. all right. It was intense. And uh, we went on for about four more days, but um, they had truckers from all over the country that were mid-level managers. And they were like 350 pounds, big, tall people. And oh, were they angry. And so you had a lot of anger in that room. And they would ask me to read back questions and answers. Oh, no. And I thought, you know, this is really quite an amazing experience. You know, but I was so glad to get away from it. <laughs> yes. I would think by the by the second day would they would have taken away the chairs. No, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. They 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 had they. It was a circus for like four days, but um, there was a lot of passion in that. So. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And we know, David, that you are also a registered diplomat reporter. Uh, what is it like and what has been your most memorable hearing in that space? Well, uh, the bottom line is that it's actually a diplomate, uh, which means I've been tested rigorously and, and strenuously in my skill and verbal skills. Mm -hmm. And so the knowledge that I bring to the table uh, when I take that test comes from several decades of experience. So the testing procedure itself plumb the depths of everything I know uh, on very esoteric levels, but also having passed the skill portion, which is uh, what they call a registered merit reporter uh, set at 260 words a minute. So wow. I can, that meaning that I can stenotype 260 words a minute. That's a lot. It is a lot. And be, people it, do speak that fast too. Yeah. Wow. So, but uh, the one thing that I know is that having a diplomat credential behind my name, as well as other court reporters, uh, gives me the confidence that, okay, I've gone as far as I can go in this profession. And, and it also determines who I'm going to bring on to work with me so I can trust them to go into an arbitration hearing and to be able to do their job correctly. Absolutely. So and congratulations for that. Like yeah. there's not many, I think, places when you can just be like, I've been as far as I think I could. Yeah. Uh, yes. but, I mean, your experience speaks for itself. It's not just to have yes. any credential or exam. It's, it's really yes. just your experience. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, um, and I, and I think that it, it also shows, you know, that uh, people can trust me, yeah. you know, that when I sit down that I not, not only exude the confidence, but I also show it in my real-time transcript. And I think that really comes down to an important point in all this is that what really counts is to make a transcript that's readable 
and is decent and not full of errors and um, not knowing what certain words are and, yeah. and stuff like that. But the, and one example is that I know of a competitor who never heard of res judicata. Uh. And so when they were talking about the motion is res judicata, that the transcript came out saying, the motion is resting on the judge's couch. Oh, wow. So that's where I think that once you have reached a certain level of skills and credentials, that it shows at least you can understand what res judicata is. You may, you may not know all the nuances of the uh, term, but at least you got to know how to write it. Yeah, and it's preparation as well, because I mean, you have to do some preparation before. I mean, I can say this because I've reviewed a few of your transcripts. And oh, I no. must say they were great. No, they were great. We never had many things to change. It was always like really perfect. So. Oh, that's great to hear. Yeah, and, and plus we're under a lot of, uh, under big deadlines. You know, when we have a hearing that produces 300 to 400 pages a day in transcript, you know, we have to make it, you know, give it our 150% in order to make that transcript as good as we can make it. Because council need to rely on it during the night while they're preparing for the next day. Absolutely. And uh, so having a good knowledge base um, gives me the confidence that, okay, I can turn it over to you in two to three hours at the end of a hearing day and knowing that it's workable, it's readable, it's decent. And so that's why I also stress the importance of punctuation, grammar, knowing the difference between certain word types and, uh, and using my brain. And that's what I really, really like to do. So David, since um, 2006, when you first started your company, what have you found to be the most interesting advances in services that can be offered in an arbitration hearing? exactly what we're doing now for the past year and a half that we've been in lockdown, yeah. video platforms and real-time remote streaming. And even though it's taken about maybe eight or nine months for people to understand, you know, the importance of having good sound or good audio, uh, the fact is the most important thing is that they can see the transcript coming up all over the world. So if you have people in Europe and Asia, South America, Middle East, the US, when they can watch the transcript being made in front of their eyes and knowing that I am listening and not just hearing it, but just listening and understanding what's being said, then that to me is always a marvel. And to have that ability to send that transcript just like that and what, have people watch it. So the technology comes second chair to the transcript, but when they work together, it's fabulous. No, definitely. And to follow up on that, uh, could you please give us a snapshot of how real-time transcription would work in that type of scenario uh, when it is uh, remote hearings uh, and what parties, I mean, you just mentioned that the good sound is essential, but what parties should be mindful of when they consider that option? One of them is to not interrupt each other. And the other is to understand the fact that if, if you're speaking into the computer microphone that's built in, um, you're gonna have a weaker ground on which to speak because a person who has a microphone like what I have, it's gonna have a stronger signal. And like so- we have, we showed you earlier. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, but definitely the people who have a headset with a microphone attached will have uh, a greater advantage. So when someone starts to interrupt, their words will not be heard. If this person with a headset or with a, an external microphone uh, will, will not be blotted out. And so that's one thing. But the other thing is to understand that when you have interpretation also, you do, do need to speak at a reasonable speed because I would say almost all languages in the world outside of English require more words to say what it is we say in, you know, regular sentences in English. Yeah. 
Yeah. So true, yeah. I never yeah. thought of it yeah, really, yeah. but it's it's yes. very true. Yes. Spanish and French, since I work with uh, you know, interpreters from both languages, you know, the, when when someone speaks in English so fast, you know how complicated terms are within international law that uh it, it it throws them off and so it's good to say you know what tone it down just a little bit this is not a criminal case this is not federal court um and you don't stammer as much and i think that the video platforms uh do force people to say okay you know what i'm on i'm on camera so i do need to do my job but also to make sure I'm clear. So no, that makes sense. And now I remember having hearings when you were the reporter uh, and asking, I remember, I think it was witnesses. Usually it happens with witnesses to slow down. Yes, yeah. exactly. And because a lot of times when people have accents or they have maybe like a paralyzed tongue or something because they had a stroke, you know, that if I can't get it, I can bet you that almost no one else will. And that means that, okay, settle it down. You want to communicate your point. And the only way to do that is to make sure that you're speaking at a reasonable speed and won't lose your audience, whether it's a, a tribunal or a single judge or in a deposition. But that's the hardest part, I think, for anyone in this profession anyway. <laughs> it is very so, interesting. Yeah. So Arbitration is still growing in popularity throughout the Caribbean region. And we here certainly would like to help bring more awareness among young people about the various career opportunities in arbitration. What advice would you give to a young person who might be interested in being a court reporter and maybe working at a company like Worldwide Reporting? I think the first thing is to find a good court reporting training program. Uh, that universities and some community colleges here in the U.S. do have those programs. But to find a program and to devote yourself to that program. <clears throat> the other thing is to have a love of language. And I keep going back to that because we always want to expand our horizons. We want to, you know, the good thing is to read books, newspapers, know your world around you, but to understand also that in the legal profession, if you were to understand how things move in court depositions or commission hearings, that you need to increase your intellect. And that means starting with understanding the words and to write them on the keyboard, but knowing what it is that you're hearing. Because the one thing that I've always been uh, leery of is being caught off guard and not knowing certain things that basically almost everyone should know. Uh, we all have our learning hurdles, and, but I think that you have to want to really push to understand your own language. Now, in the Caribbean itself, you have so many different dialects, uh, you have languages that I'm not sure, like in, in Jamaica, you have um, Creole, is that right? Patois. 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 Uh, yeah, Patois and English. And so I think the challenge is going to be, how do you work with that as a student to you know, understand that, okay, if the governing language is English, but you're also going to have witnesses testifying with the patois, you know, how are you going to deal with both with one single machine? And so I think that you have to have the desire to try to bridge that uh, challenge and, and go for it. There was something else. It's a good training program, level of language. And, and mentorship. And mentorship. Oh, yeah. 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 Yes, because if you get, if you are taken under the wing of uh, several court reporters, which I highly recommend, not just one person in general, but uh, at least you can get diversity of opinions about how things are done. 
And even though I love the mentors that I had uh, that were reporters in World War II, the fact is they taught me one or two things that got me in trouble professionally. And one of them being, what? yes, uh, such as cleaning up some of the questions of the lawyers. And I thought, really? And they said, oh yeah, and they love it. And I thought, okay. So the first deposition I did, I got a call from the lawyer who took the deposition. He said, who authorized you to change what I had said? I know exactly what I said here. And that's not what came out in the transcript. And I said, I thought that maybe, you know, cleaning it up. He said, who gave you the authorization? And all of a sudden, I realized, okay, there you have it. So verbatim is as verbatim does. And it turns out to be one of the saving graces, too, in my job. So other than that, you know, you get different perspectives of, okay, how do you mark exhibits? How do you, you know, set up a transcript contents page, et cetera, that, um, you know, I... Okay. I think that that would be very helpful for a student. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, for members of our audience who may be new to arbitration, could you please explain to us how does a good reporter become selected for an arbitration hearing? Even though I know you get selected, and I, I mean, I've seen you in so many hearings, but yes. uh, yeah, just if you could tell us. Um, depending on the firm that you work for, uh, they will have a lot of contacts with law firms to do private uh, ad hoc uh, commercial hearings, ICC, um, ad hoc, whatever. And so they will, that will be a start. But companies that have the business relationships with uh, the other institutions in the world, like PCA, SCC, uh, ICSID, um, and so forth, that will open up the doors to arbitration hearings. So I don't know, does that kind of address it? No, that is, no, that totally makes sense because you told us earlier when ICSID called you yes. and you had to show them so that completely makes sense, yeah. Yes, and also one thing I've, oh, sorry, go ahead. And via IS because we have this contact, obviously. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly right. And the other thing I forgot to mention is that part of my experience uh, also came from the early 90s when I used to report the board of directors of the IMF and the World Bank. And the one good thing that helped me professionally was to attune my ear to 189 accents from oh, yes. people all over the world. And believe me, there are 189. And that's when they speak clearly. <laughs> so, <laughs> but because of my work in those boards and doing real time at the IMF, uh, really set me on the right path to make, just go right in to start doing uh, uh, international arbitrations, starting with the uh, Vivendi one. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yes, it's a, it's a, it's a challenge, and a lot of people, you know, have to force themselves to get used to listening carefully to the words people are saying with accents. And so I think once you kind of get up to sort of like the top of a pyramid, that pyramid becomes even steeper because now people are going to be watching your transcript and see how well you understand what's being said. Yes. whether it's by an American or by someone from Britain or anywhere else in the world. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's definitely a, a big uh, <laughs> learning curve. But once you kind of bridge it, then you realize that, you know what, I can do anything. And then you have another um, sense of confidence that, uh, okay, give me a big case, you know, and we'll see how, uh, and I'll be able to do what I need to do. That's kind of. Yeah. No, that's great. That was great. That kind was of fluffy, great. wasn't it? That was so, David, we're coming up on our time, but there's at least okay. two things that we need to know from you. Absolutely. One, I really would like to know what do you binge watch on Netflix? Like, this is super important. <laughs> 
<laughs> Yellowstone. Have you watched the show Yellowstone? It's crazy. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Yellowstone. That's the only one. Um, we can't, we we gotten in the habit in the past six months of watching the uh, the Great British Baking Show. Okay. Ah. <laughs> I haven't seen it. So, so yeah, it's your, fun. With your inch, well, because you're in the arbitration world. Yes. I should have asked you if you're like one of our legal shows, Boston Legal or The Good Wife. No. Are you on any of those? No. no. I've seen enough reality in the legal profession to know that those kind of dramas just make me cross my eyes. <laughs> I mean, you've seen like literally chairs flying. Yes. So you, you can <laughs> exactly. You well, can probably write a movie, a movie yeah, script now. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you know, even in international arbitrations, I've seen some outrageous stuff. You know, uh, I wish I could talk about a couple of them, but uh, since they are bound under my confidentiality agreement, I can tell you that I have seen some absolutely outrageous things. Um, and and I, I'm like, oh, really? You know, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. but it, yeah, anyway, the, the uh, it's nice to know that at least in arbitrations, things are a lot more controlled. Yeah. And, and I always say, you have the best of judges and arbitrators. You have the best of counsel in the world. But you also have the best of cases too. Mm. It doesn't mean that I escape from the horrors of life because some of these cases bring in elements of torture, war, um, and other horribles that people do to each other. But I think for the most part, 99% of the time, it's very, very nice. It's nice to see, you know, how countries and companies deal with each other and country and countries with each other. I do state to state arbitrations yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. No, it's such beautifully said. Uh, <laughs> and I think, yeah, no, for arbitration life, having probably the most, I mean, you are the most famous school. Ah, probably, yeah, probably everybody Bush, knows yeah. David. Oh, that's great. You know, I and I love it too. And I, it's not an ego thing. It's just that I like being part of it. You know, I love to take down what people say, but I also want to understand what they're saying. And that, I think that comes from within my heart as well as my brain. So oh, I, I'll do you, it. David. You're welcome. Thank you so much for beautiful words. Yeah. I mean, of, course, of course, you would say things. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was great seeing you all. Yeah. Good seeing you. And uh, yeah, thank you again. Okay. You're welcome. Your be well, be safe, and be thank happy. You. I took my COVID, uh, my vaccine, yeah. my vaccine today. today. Which one? Pfizer? No, I'm going to be VI. What do we take? AstraZeneca. Um, AstraZeneca. Yeah, they don't have AstraZeneca? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah, we had our second one about a month ago and went through the hospital system here. I thought if I had to rely on the, uh, the government of D.C. to put us on a wait list, it would be five years from now. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> we'll all be dead. We'll see you soon here. Yes, in the we look VI. forward to seeing you. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. And I can't wait to come back to BVI, too. Yes. So, yeah. I look forward to well, seeing you. Thank you, David. You're welcome. My pleasure. Be well. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. David, thank you so much again for being with us today on Arbitration Life. It's always a pleasure uh, to discuss with you, and it was great to hear more about your work. For more Arbitration Life, be sure to follow us on arbitrationlife.org. And on other social media platforms. Of course. Bye and get vaccinated. <laughs>